separation has occurred. All systems are go for entry, descent, and landing. We are currently six minutes from landing at the GOSEP crater in the southern hemisphere of Mars. Literally, and this is no overstatement, the future of the Mars program was at stake. But perhaps a lot more was writing on it. The future of the space science program at NASA and NASA's reputation itself. The vehicle has now hit the top of the Martian atmosphere. Everything that you've worked for, for so many years, is on the line. Expected parachute deploy in three, two, one, mark. Parachute was detected. <laughs> Lander separation event is detected. Spacecraft reporting that the radar is in lock. Expected retro rocket ignition on my mark, mark. <laughs> Awaiting confirmation that retro rocket ignition has occurred. I think there were two almost simultaneous emotions. One was relief. The other was pride in the team. Uh, I mean, it, what we do is, is truly a team effort. It takes so many people to make these missions work. It looks easy when you see it on television. The rover has landed base pedal down, which means right side up. <laughs> it was uh, a thrill beyond thrills, not just actually witnessing what was taking place, but to be able to experience that through the eyes of these amazing individuals. When those first pictures came back, everyone was so overwhelmed, and they were so much earlier than had been anticipated. Even during difficult times here at JPL, always a sense of optimism. And I go back to that great uh, line that if you don't take risks, you're not going to learn anything. We're going to egress and then we're going to drive. And a good evening from the flight deck at the Opportunity. At this time, we are approximately 5 minutes 53 seconds from uh, landing at the Meridiani Plains near the equator of Mars. Current velocity is 12,193 miles per hour. Parachute deploy has been detected. For an altitude 5,000 feet, 168 miles per hour. Radar solution, Matrix 21. Retro rocket ignition on my mark. Mark. At this time, the yeah, retro rocket, we have confirmation. We have ignited. We are now awaiting confirmation of positive signals bouncing on the ground. We're seeing it on the LTP. We're on Mars, everybody. Governor Schwarzenegger was there, Vice President uh, Gore was there. Wayne Lee with Representatives John Culbertson and Adam Schiff. What was, I think, really most fun for, for the non-scientists in the room was uh, just watching the faces of the people that had devoted the last uh, several years of their life to this and seeing their enjoyment and their excitement. And here you have these you know, normally fairly stoic scientific types, not given to great hyperbole, who are going crazy. Not only did we begin a new chapter in our understanding of Mars and, and a new way to explore planetary surfaces with, with rovers, but we also helped to stimulate the, the space program in other directions. Holy smokes. <laughs> When our children and grandchildren bring home that science book where it says, you know, there is evidence of liquid water on Mars, to know that you helped build and operate um, and, and direct the rover to that spot, uh, yeah, that, that's very rewarding. But even beyond the science, the success of the Mars rovers does something for the American spirit. Perhaps the most important thing is the Mars rovers have a life of their own, not just scientifically, in terms of the school kids of the country, with the American people, if not the world. We can do something that nobody else on Earth has ever done. Hard to believe, five years 
I don't know how many times I took my car to repair over the last five years, and here we have these rovers still working. But first, good afternoon, and uh, uh, I want to say a few words about the rovers, or the Mars rover, uh, by not talking very much about them. And what I want to do is to put in perspective how do they fit in our whole picture of Mars exploration. Uh, you may not remember, uh, because many of you are relatively young, that we started attempts to explore Mars 44 years ago. There might be a couple of you who were here at that time. And that first attempt uh, was with Mariner 3. And some of you remember that Mariner 3 did not work. You know, at launch, we had an issue with, uh, with the shield, you know, on the top of the rocket, and it went down into the ocean. But fortunately, we had Mariner 4, which was launched very shortly after that, I mean, a few weeks after that. And that gave us our first look at Mars, you know, six months later. And it looked like the moon. It looked like very, there is nothing exciting about it. It was just craters and so on. And it's amazing, you look at it now, after we flew the Viking, sorry, first of all, a series of Mariners, Mariner 3, 4, 6, and 7, the Viking, Mars Observer, Global Surveyor, Pathfinder, Mars Climate Orbiter, Polar Lander, which did not you know, work, Deep Space 2, uh, Odyssey, Mars, Reconnaissance Orbiter, and Spirit and Opportunity now, and we have a completely different picture of what Mars looked like. It's a very live planet in geologic terms. Uh, we had our good days and bad days. Uh, from the bad days, we learned a lot. They were heartbreaking experiences, but we learned from them. And here we have our nation has these two rovers on Mars, which have been operating for five years, in addition to the two orbiters and Phoenix, which did this job over the last uh, six months. Well, what's, in my mind, what's exciting is that in, in these machine, all of you, you have poured basically your hard work, your emotion, your love into them, and uh, basically put your hopes and dreams, uh, and that's what we are seeing, all that advances that have occurred as a result of that. They effectively are really extension of us. They are extension of each and every one of us. Uh, if, if anything marks differently these rovers than other things, uh, it's the perspective they provide. I mean, we have spacecraft which are in orbit, uh, around different planets, and we get very exciting images. But in these rovers, because they have two eyes like our eyes, and they move around like we move, basically every day they give us a new perspective of what's on another planet, as if we were, you know, walking, you know, on that planet. Now, I have no idea how much they, they, uh, they will be with us. Uh, but in a sense, they will be with us forever, because we really have lived through the development, through the operations, through the excitement of these rovers. And in a sense, they became American icons. Uh, they represent some of the best American values. Uh, being curious, uh, boldly reaching to new frontiers, doing hard things like Kennedy would say, and doing mighty things like Teddy Roosevelt you know, would say. So that's what all of you as a team and these rovers as an extension of us you know, have been doing. Uh, there is not a single day that I don't think about them. There is not a single day that I don't think about all of you. There is not a single day that I don't think about those six minutes of terror, which happened twice. <laughs> and every time I see this video, and I can tell you all these videos, and I show them almost on the average twice a week in talks that I have, every time I look at them, even after five years, the last one being a couple of weeks ago, you know, my heartbeat speeds up. You know, almost tears come to my eye. I mean, it's uncontrollable, you know, to see the excitement and, and what people did and the emotion which came, you know, with all the teams that have done that. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you, uh, everybody who participated in this, all the way from Miles O'Brien, who was our reporter, to the scientists who worked with us, to the local official, to the national officials, everybody was part of our team. And I think we all can take a great pride you know, in what has happened over the last five years. And hopefully we'll be taking pride about what will be happening over the next you know, four or five years, both on these rovers as well as other activities that we are doing. Now, before I step down and introduce John Callis, I want to recognize a number of officials that are here, and uh, either they are here or they will be coming shortly. First, I want to start with Supervisor Mike Antonovich, I see him sitting there, who represents JPL in the Los Angeles, you know, uh, Los Angeles Board of Supervisors. We have uh, Mayor Stephen Del uh, Gerso, here is the mayor of the city of La Cañada. Uh, I don't see Bill Bogart. Oh, that, Bill just came, sorry. So this is Mayor Bill Bogart of the city of Pasadena. 
And I always say we are so important that we are part of two cities here. Not many places can, can claim that. Uh, we have representing Congressman David Dreyer. Mark, Mark is, uh, Harmson is here. And representing Congressman Adam Schiff is Yvonne Sue. Yvonne is here also. Also, we are so important to have two congressmen who represent us. And also, we have representing Senator Carol Liu, Estaline Mangioglu. Estaline is here. Thank you for coming. And representing Assemblyman Anthony Portantino is uh, Juliana Hines. Thank you, Juliana. So again, I want to thank all of you for coming. We really do take a great pride of being part of the community that, uh, that is here. And with this now, I want to introduce a present project manager who is really making this sure that these rovers are, are roving all over the place, and that's John Callas. John? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Wow. Uh, shortly after I became project manager about... Uh, uh, two and a half years ago, I was standing in the lunch line with Pete Teichinger, and Pete was asking me how it was going. And I said that it, it was going phenomenal, it was uh, outstanding. And there was another uh, rover developer who was also in the lunch line who turned around and said, yeah, it's easy when someone hands you something that works. <laughs> and that, that is so true. These rovers are phenomenal. They're magnificent machines. And the people, the teams that operate these rovers and keep them going every day are phenomenal. So my job is indeed an easy one. You know, we've all been talking about, wow, who would have thought they would have lasted five years? For me, actually, the, the, the question is really, who would have thought the adventure would have been this great? I mean, it is really a phenomenal accomplishment. And yet there's more to come. You know, we, we've climbed mountains. We've descended into deep craters. We've survived three Martian winters. We've survived two rover-killing dust storms. Um, and, and you know, it's amazing just the discoveries that have you know, reshaped our understanding of this alien world. You know, all of you have been a great part uh, of this whole undertaking. And all of you must take credit for this fine accomplishment. So please give yourself a hand at this time, everyone. Now, uh, of course, thousands and thousands of people have contributed to this mission, and it would be impossible to recognize everyone. But I would like to acknowledge just a few people here today. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the previous project managers, Pete Tysinger, Richard Cook, and Jim Erickson, to stand and be acknowledged. Please, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Also, we wouldn't be here celebrating if it wasn't for our sister missions, Mars Odyssey for consistently and reliably returning over 97% of our data, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, like a guardian angel, keeping a watchful eye on our two intrepid explorers. Phil Varghese, Jim Erickson, please stand representing your projects. Thank you very much. And join me in acknowledging the two Mars program managers that husband this project during the development phase and through the numerous extended missions. Farooz Nadiri, Fook Lee, please stand and be acknowledged. Thank you all very much. Now join me in watching a short video tribute to Spirit. Experience of spirit is something that I've really kind of integrated into my whole identity. You know, this has become part of what I do. And it looked at the very beginning of the mission like this was going to be something that I got to do for a very brief time for three months. And that was terrific and it was unique and it was special. And I was really looking forward to it. And I never in my wildest imagination believed it was going to go on for five years. Spirit really has had to have a lot of spirit to, to keep going. It's been the little rover that could in a way. It's had to work very hard for all of its discoveries.
Shortly after Spirit landed, we uh, had a problem where we lost contact with the rover for a couple of days. And this was a particularly scary time because not only had we lost contact with one of the rovers and we didn't know why, we had another rover coming in for a landing uh, hard in our heels and we didn't know if whatever had happened to the first rover was going to happen to the second one. It turned out that uh, we were able to regain uh, control of Spirit. She had filled up her own memory system, her, the equivalent of her hard disk, and she couldn't boot up. And she started booting up and said, oh look, my hard disk is full, I can't boot up. Let me try rebooting. And so she was basically just sitting there on Mars punching her own reboot button um, until we finally came along and figured out what was going on and were able to get her to stop. One of uh, Spirit's very dramatic challenges was when she was racing the clock for her first, uh, trying to get to her, her first winter haven to try to get to a hill where she could point her solar panels directly toward the sun and survive for the winter. And she was already behind, a little bit behind schedule, and she was racing across uh, these plains toward the hill. And as she was on her way, uh, her right front wheel, which had been giving us some trouble, finally stopped working. And so now, instead of having a six-wheeled rover, we had a rover with five wheels and an anchor. We've ended up having to drive backwards because it's a lot easier to pull an anchor than to push one. But naturally, since it's, it's built to have very good traction, it basically is digging into the ground and digging this trench behind us. And as we dig this trench, we're able to see things that are normally invisible, things that are under the surface. One thing that we seem to be finding almost anywhere we're digging this trench are these widespread deposits of various kinds of salts and minerals. They look this brilliant white or yellow in the color images, um, and that's because they're uh, either sulfur or silica or salts uh, of various kinds. And the really important thing about these minerals, and salts in particular, is that the only way they form is with water. So the fact that we're finding these salts is real evidence that there was hot water over a very widespread area where Spirit is exploring right now, not just little isolated pockets. Mars really could have been a place that supported life. And without these rovers driving over these vast distances, far beyond their expectations, we would never have known that. Even on Mars, life can give you lemons, but you make lemonade out of that. Um, in Spirit's case, uh, you know, she turned dragging that uh, right front wheel into a great scientific discovery. Winter is a harsher time for Spirit. She's up on the top of home plate and we were uh, scooting across the top of home plate as fast as we could toward the north face so we could tilt her solar panels as directly as possible toward the sun. And as we were doing that, she went over a little rise and down into a, a pit, uh, which we now call Tartarus. In this case, not only was she figuratively um, on the edge, she was also literally on the edge because the only way to escape from that pit was to drive right up along the edge of home plate with absolutely no margin for error whatsoever and kind of drive up and around this uh, feature and then off to uh, where she was trying to get to and, and where she could be safe for the winter. Certainly the, the biggest thing that stands out and Spirit's whole mission is her view from the top of Husband Hill. Um, this little rover that wasn't ever really designed to climb over anything bigger than her own wheels um, had now climbed a hill the height of the Statue of Liberty and was standing there at the top of that hill and took this beautiful 360 degree panorama and just saw the most beautiful striking hilly landscape with this spectacular orange sky and the, the beautiful rust colored ground and it just sort of put the whole project in perspective for me. This was what we were there for, to explore and go out and see new places that have never been seen by human eyes. Mars is a pretty harsh place. We've had dust storms before. We have really low power situations in winter. We've had other small glitches that have caused us some tense moments, but um, Spirit seems to always find a way of turning some kind of adversity into uh, something positive. It was only by outlasting her design specifications and never giving up and absolutely never you know, letting Mars get her down that she ended up uh, finding what she had gone to Mars for. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the principal investigator for the Mars Exploration Rovers, Dr. Steve Squires. Uh, 
this thing hasn't turned out anything like the way I expected it to. <laughs> um, when we first proposed what eventually became MER to NASA, it really was nothing like what this mission has become. We all remember the pictures of the Viking landing sites and the Pathfinder landing sites, these flat planes strewn with boulders. The boulders all kind of looked alike, but you hoped that maybe they were different from one another somehow. And the idea was really very simple, to take a set of fairly straightforward geological tools, put them on a vehicle, get them to one of those places, and give them a few months to drive around from one boulder to another, see if there's some diversity there, and try to piece together what the place might once have been like. And do this for about three months or so, and you've done a, a darn good geologic experiment. It wasn't the rover mission of my dreams, but it would have been good, and I was proud to have been associated with it. What we've gotten has been so much beyond the rover mission of my dreams, I still, I still can't believe what's happening. Uh, I mean, you know the story. We've been there for five years. We've driven 20, 20 kilometers, uh, climbed the mountains, gone into the craters. It has been, in the literal sense of the phrase, the adventure of a lifetime. You remember when we got to the summit of Husband Hill? That view from the top? You remember when we pulled, remember the first day that we pulled up to the rim of Endurance Crater? And it was like pulling up to the edge of the Grand Canyon. It was just phenomenal. And, you know, I've thought a lot about why did this happen? You know, why are they still going after five years? And a lot of people would point to the fact that we have had some lucky breaks. I mean, when you have a wind gust that totally cleans off your solar arrays when the rover's about to die, okay, things are going your way. <laughs> but I'm a firm believer that you make your own luck. The reason the rover was still alive when that wind gust happened, hundreds of sols into the mission, was that a remarkable team had built some absolutely remarkable hardware. I tried once to make a list of the names of all the people who have worked on this project. There were more than 4,000 names on that list, and I missed an awful lot of people. It is a team that has accomplished what I thought was impossible. It is a team that is united by many things, but above all, a passion for what we do. And it's just such a joy to be part of this group, and I will treasure it for the rest of my days. You know, when something like this happens, when you have a, a celebration of five years on Mars, it, it gets you thinking, you know, what is our mission's legacy? What is it going to be, what's going to be its place in history? And, you know, I'm probably the worst guy in the world to try to answer that question. I'm too close to it. But there are a couple things that I hope for. One, of course, is our scientific discoveries and what we have learned and, and continue to learn about Mars. But the other one, I think actually in the end, might be even more important, and I kind of hope that it will be. Like a number of people on this project, I grew up during the 60s um, watching television and watching Mercury and Gemini and Apollo as a kid and you know, just dreaming of growing up and, and sending spaceships to Mars someday. And I've actually gotten to do that with the finest team in the world. And what I really hope is that people now who are in high school and middle school and elementary school are watching Spirit and watching Opportunity and watching a bunch of geeks jumping up and down like they just won the Super Bowl, <laughs> OK? And looking at that and saying, damn, that's cool, but I bet I could do even better. And if we've accomplished that, we've accomplished the most important things of all. Thanks a lot. Opportunity? And now we'll have a uh, short video tribute to Opportunity, please. I was an optimist from the very beginning. Um, and that I, I knew the rovers uh, were well built and that as long as we survived landing that we had a, a very good chance of an extended mission.
For Opportunity, things uh, went well from the very beginning. When we landed, right within uh, a short distance of the rover was exposed bedrock. And when the scientists examined that bedrock in detail, they determined that it was laid down in water some three and a half to four billion years ago. So this was the first evidence of ancient surface water on Mars. And it's something that uh, the scientists were looking for, and it was right there where they landed. So uh, they couldn't have asked for a better spot. Well, I think the greatest uh, accomplishment of Eagle Crater was uh, they saw things that uh, look like blueberries. And uh, these are things that are little uh, tiny balls of uh, material that uh, look like something that was um, produced in the uh, presence of water. And so this was one of the first uh, indications that uh, there had been water on Mars in the past. And so I think that was one of the greatest uh, accomplishments. Craters are great for the geologists because they're like time tunnels. They're big holes in the ground, and by going down into the crater, you're essentially going back in time because you know the older rocks are towards the bottom. Opportunity is the crater exploring rover uh, on this side of the planet. Endurance was exciting because uh, this is the first big crater we had entered. That's something we never thought we would ever do with a rover because it was considered too dangerous. So we actually had to do some additional work here on Earth to verify that it was safe, not only to go down into the crater, but that we could get back out again. At times, we've reached slopes about 30 degrees and, and slightly higher. It's actually hard for people to walk on 30 degree slopes. We had a lot of close calls where, you know, we'd, we'd be driving a particular location and we'd start sliding. And then we'd try to go back up and we'd slide. And there's a certain point where if you keep on sliding, you know, you may never get out. It was uh, a little nerve-wracking, but they, they determined it was worth going in there because uh, scientifically it was so interesting. Our big uh, crater was Victoria. It's a half-mile diameter crater that took us about two years to, to reach. And uh, it was exciting because we'd never uh, been to a crater quite that large. And we had to find, at first, a safe place to go into this crater. Well, for us, actually, it was a little scary, to be perfectly honest. Imagine going to the edge of the Grand Canyon and looking over, and then here you are, you're commanding a rover to go to the very edge. And as a mission manager, you're responsible for the health and safety of this rover. And so the scientists say, go closer, go closer, because we want to see what's at the very edge. You have to be very careful about getting as close to the edge as you can, but not falling over. The greatest threat to opportunity survival was a global Martian dust storm. And these are massive storms. I mean, they block out the sun. It was quite a, a surprise because, you know, we hadn't seen anything of that magnitude before. Um, and so it was, it was very stressful at that time. And we, that was actually right before we started our ingress into Victoria Crater. That was very scary because during that period, you know, the cloud got very dark. And since we're a solar powered vehicle, um, our, our power got very low. So there was about a two week period where it was touch and go every day and we didn't know whether we'd come in the next day and the rover would still be there. But it, it rode out the storm, it got through it, the skies cleared and, and the rover was fine. Opportunity will be leaving Victoria Crater and heading to an even larger crater this is called Endeavor, and it's 20 kilometers in diameter, so it's about 12 miles in size. And it's about 20 kilometers away, so you know, another 12 miles in distance. So it's actually further away than all the driving that Opportunity has done in the past five years. So it's a, it's a very distant objective, it's a very ambitious objective, but scientifically, that's the direction to head. Even if we don't reach this uh, new, larger, giant crater, uh, the science that we can do along the way will add to the Martian history books. It'll extend our, our historical understanding of the geology on Mars. I think the, the great contribution that these rovers have made is that they have made Mars a familiar place. The images that we take are taken very much with a human perspective because the cameras on the rover are right up about eye level for a, a person standing on Mars. And so you get the, the perspective as if you were there yourself looking over these great vistas.
with five years of operation for, for both rovers and all the images, you know, the over a quarter million images that have been returned, have really made Mars uh, seem like our neighborhood. It's no longer an, a, a foreign or alien or distant world. It's now a familiar place that has Earth-like characteristics. We love the rovers as if they're our own children because it's gone through so much, it's accomplished so much, it's gone through hardships, it's gone through incredible victories. And so, you know, we love the rovers, we care about them, we worry about them, uh, we're excited when it makes new discoveries. Um, they're amazing vehicles. Near the end of the Prime mission back in April 2004, the rovers gained a new admirer, someone literally out of this world. Commander Mike Fink had just begun a six-month tour on the International Space Station. To be properly equipped, one of our own, Jim Rice, uh, provided him with a pair of 3D glasses in his personal kit so he could view the rover anaglyphs while on orbit. Now fast forward five years, and today Mike Fink is again on board the International Space Station commanding uh, Expedition 18, and he sends us this tribute. Hi, I'm Mike Fink, commander of the International Space Station Expedition 18. And on behalf of my crew and the entire International Space Station team, I'd like to extend our hearty congratulations to the Mars Exploration Rover Team for your 50-year anniversary on Mars. I'd like to uh, say uh, recognize and uh, say hello to Steve Squires, the uh, principal investigator, project manager John Callis, and project scientist Bruce Bannard, and all of the other scientists, all the other engineers, all the other technicians, the administrative assistants, everybody who's helped out on this grand adventure. You guys are really paving the way for humanity to go to the stars. So you guys have uh, done incredible work. And uh, here aboard the International Space Station, where we're also working towards uh, humanity going on to the stars. Uh, we're, we're really proud of you and really glad to be on, on the same team. So congratulations from the International Space Station. Among our many special guests here today is someone who helped bring about the space age. Uh, he's a space pioneer, not in the building of rockets or spacecraft, but in the imagining of them and the other ways we might experience the vast cosmos around us. About the same time that JPL was coming into being many years ago, just a few miles away here in Los Angeles, this pioneer was in the process of becoming one of our nation's most gifted writers. He's one of those writers whose writing has changed the way people think. He has more than 500 published works exemplifying the American imagination at its most creative. His best known works, The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, Fahrenheit 451, and Something Wicked This Way Comes are masterpieces. He is one of the truly classic authors of our time. Please join me in welcoming Ray Bradbury. Young, I lived in Waukegan, Illinois, next to one of my favorite uncles, and he had all the Martian books of Edgar Rice Burroughs. I used to go over to his house and borrow these books and take them home and read them. When I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be a writer. I moved to Tucson, Arizona. And I lived on Lowell Avenue. You can't do better than that, can you? <laughs> I loved Percival Lowell and the drawings of Scaparelli, and I fell in love with Mars. 
I read a book, The Gods of Mars, by Edgar Rice Burroughs, and it needed a sequel, but I didn't have the money to buy the sequel. So when I was 12 years old, I wrote the sequel to The Gods of Mars. <laughs> That's the very first thing that I wrote about landing on Mars and saving Dejah Thoris, the wife of John Carter. So you see, my life has been spent on Mars from the very first. And when I was in my teens and when I was 30 years old, I published the Martian Chronicles. And Aldous Huxley, the great English writer, called me to his house one day for tea when I was 30 years old. And he said, Mr. Bradbury, do you know what you've done? Do you know what you are? I said, what am I? He said, you're a poet. You're a poet. You've written about Mars. But it's poetry. For God's sake, this book is going to be around forever. And to have all this Huxley, the writer of Brave New Worlds, say this to me, I couldn't believe it. Because I didn't realize all during my 30s I was writing about the future so completely. I was so madly in love with Mars. So many years later, <clears throat> I came out to Jet Propulsion Lab when we had the first landing. And in March of 1971, and I stayed up all night uh, watching the screen, waiting for the films to come on, projecting our first images of Mars. And I noticed a man standing behind me. I was afraid to speak to him at first, but I finally did. It was Werner von Braun. <laughs> Werner von Braun is the two halves of the destiny of man. He is the living metaphor of the dark and the light. He's the man that invented the V2 rocket that destroyed London and killed people, but he's also the man that helped invent the rocket to take us to the moon and to take us to Mars. So I called him over and he signed an envelope for me and I have it here. And he spoke well of me and the influence of my book on his being an inventor of the rocket. So he was there all night with me the night of our first landing on Mars. In the early morning, the first images began to come through to us of the planet Mars. And at noon, the ABC TV people put me on TV to interview me about this landing. And Roy Neal, the announcer, said to me, Mr. Bradbury, how does it feel that we've landed on Mars and there are no cities there, and there are no Martians. I said, you are ridiculous. <laughs> the cities don't count. It's the Martians that count. And from this day on, we are the Martians. <laughs> no. So I said, shut up and get the hell out of here. <laughs> and I told Roy Neal to go to hell <laughs> because I was there weeping. I cried all night long. It was wonderful. And then back in 1969, I was in London the night we landed on the moon. And David Frost asked me to come over to his show to be interviewed on TV to be seen by millions of people to celebrate the landing on the moon. So I got there at 8.30 at night in July, and we landed on the moon, and David Frost made fun of the whole thing. Macmillan, the prime minister of London, was on, and David Frost made fun of him. And he made fun of the astronauts 
stepping out of the rocket or getting ready to step out and land on the moon for the first time. And around 8.45 that night, he said, now I'm going to introduce to you a great American talent. He's going to speak about landing on the moon. And he said, I thought he was talking about me. He said, and here he is, Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> I said, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Eng Engelbert Humperdinck, how stupid can you get? <laughs> so I ran out of, the, out of the television room, I ran out in the parking lot, and the producer followed me and said, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm leaving the show. That man is a stupid idiot. <laughs> he doesn't realize this is the greatest night in the history of mankind. We've been waiting for millions of years to go to the moon, and we're here now. He should be celebrating. Get me a taxi cab. Get me out of here. <laughs> so I drove across London, and I appeared on a show with Walter Cronkite at midnight on Telstar, seen by millions of people. And I spoke of how I felt about landing on the moon. It was a fa fantastic broadcast. I brought a copy with me tonight, and you'll see it in a moment. But when I was done with that broadcast, instead of taking a cab back to my hotel in London, I walked across London all night long. The night we landed on the moon, I wept with joy. I couldn't believe I was only 48 years old. I thought I would be an old man. I thought I'd be 80 or 90 when we landed on the moon. Here I am, only 48. I couldn't believe it. It was wonderful. So in the morning, I got to my hotel. There's a tabloid newspaper out in front. I looked. It said, Neil Armstrong walks on the moon at dawn. And the headline above is, Bradbury walks at midnight. <laughs> Isn't that great? Now they'll do the right. Yeah? Um, you got like a minute? What? You got a minute more? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you finish? Yeah, okay. I want them to put the film on. Oh, um. Go. I want you okay, to see. Okay, um. It will be showed later? It'll be showed later. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Ray Bradbury. Our keynote speaker today is an Emmy Award winning 26 year broadcast news veteran who successfully melded a talent for telling complex stories in accessible terms with a lifelong passion for aviation, space, technology, and the environment. Working for nearly 17 years as a correspondent, anchor, and producer at CNN in Atlanta and New York, he has focused the leading edge of research and, <clears throat> research and development. Known for his unparalleled coverage of space exploration, he led CNN's coverage for the past 17 years, including the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia in February 2003, reporting live for 16 straight hours. Uh, that accident scuttled the deal he had just brokered with NASA to make him the first journalist to fly in the space shuttle. He's an experienced instrument rated pilot and, and, and an airplane owner and has leveraged that insight and knowledge into unrivaled television coverage of aviation. Helping us now to appreciate the momentous impact of the Mars Exploration Rover mission, please welcome Miles O'Brien. Great to be here. How are you all? Behind all this facial hair is a former CNN space correspondent. Just been accepted in the, to the uh, anchor protection program. And I was told by my government handlers to grow a beard to uh, adjust my 
uh, looks, please don't tell them I'm here, okay? Actually, I grew this despite the misgivings of my lovely bride, Sandy, because for the first time in 26 years, I own this turf, baby. <laughs> I'm taking it back. I was thinking about planting a flag, but that seemed a little painful. It's always great to be here at my favorite space portal, despite that picture. Uh, the gateway to the universe is here, one of the smartest places on the planet, a fun place, Disneyland for nerds. <laughs> you know, Mars is my second favorite planet, and many of you in this room make me feel as if I've been there. How cool is that? Thanks for the outstanding, vicarious thrill ride these past 40 plus years, especially these past five. Sometimes I think we take for granted uh, how amazing it is, how awash we are in these wonderful images, these high-resolution, panoramic, microscopic, three-dimensional images shot on the surface or in orbit. What we found is a place that uh, looks an awful lot like home, if you're from New Mexico, I guess. And I think that's part of the appeal. You, know, you look at Eagle Crater, and a human being can imagine being there in hiking boots. Uh, it's truly a transformative experience. And when you consider all the proof we have now amassed here, or you have now amassed here, that this place was once warm and wet, you can't help but look at those pictures and think about our place in the universe and wonder and how close we are to learning if we actually do have some company. How great is it to be alive at this time when we just might learn the answer to that question? Uh, we're lucky to have people like you who know how to get that answer. Of course, we've been curious about the night sky since cavemen looked up and said, ugh, or something. <laughs> or when they saw the spaceship land and the little green men build Stonehenge. Did you hear they, they found another Stonehenge in Lake Michigan? Did you hear about this thing? Imagine that, alien scuba divers. Hard to, hard, who knew? Who knew? Uh, while we're on the subject of water and Mars, we've, we touched on this a moment ago. It's worth uh, talking about the origins of our modern fascination uh, with the red planet. Mr. Bradbury spoke about that. It all begins with water. Giovanni Schiaparelli and the canali he wrote about, he meant natural channels. But in this case, something was gained in the translation. And people assumed he was talking about canals, which implies some sort of Martian corps of engineers or something. Uh, no one took the ball farther and ran harder than, with that than the blue-blooded astronomer Percival Lowell. You know, you don't hear about uh, many boys being named Percival these days, do you? I wonder why. Anyway, Lowell was uh, convinced uh, the canals were built by smart beings who were running out of water. This, of course, begat H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, which begat Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, Ray Bradbury, of course, Robinson Crusoe on Mars, and Marvin the Martian. And for a long time, there was nothing to stop the Martian train from kind of rolling down the tracks until mid-60s, when you guys, or your scientific ancestors, launched a series of spacecraft called Mariner. Now, scan line by scan line, these faxes, essentially, from Mars gave us a whole new view of the red planet. And it wasn't a very good place to find any condos or build them. Uh, so much for that fun. But before we could get too depressed, we had astronauts on the moon to entertain us. Maybe not David Frost, but it entertained the rest of us. And then before too long, Mars came into focus again, like it never had before. 1976, the Viking landers arrived on the surface and the crowd went wild. Mars in vivid color, do not adjust your set. It really is kind of sepia there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Viking didn't find smoking gun proof of life on Mars, but doesn't it seem kind of unlikely they'd find any guns at all there? But, but seriously, the, the data was kind of ambiguous, and even uh, today, as I understand it, there is some debate in the scientific community. They're not speaking with one voice in this. Do scientists really disagree a lot or something? Is that, <laughs> is that how it works? I, I'm shocked. Fast forward 20 years. Now, that's what I call a gap. Don't do that again. No more 20-year gaps. Pathfinder, who, yeah, don't ever do that. That was bad. Pathfinder, who, who would have predicted that one? Uh, the internets, all of them, as a mass medium, were new then. And, and the Google was just a, just a glint in Sergey and Larry's eyes. And there was Pathfinder on Mars, and JPL was putting pictures on the web almost as fast as they got them. Imagine that, you know? Uh, millions of hits, the first global web extravaganza. Uh, Mars was ready for its close-ups. The missions that have followed have either built on this connection or built on the suspense because they didn't make it. Uh, each time you take us back there, 
we learn something new and we see something cool, like the blueberries, the spheres that had to be formed by water, or we touch or taste ice as Phoenix did. And each time you all take us to the edge of what is possible. It's nice to be there, right there with you. The Mars Rover team took the Pathfinder philosophy one step further. You all have actually allowed the public to see every image you see. That is truly remarkable. Nothing like that has ever happened in the history of science that I'm aware of. Of course, I'm a history major. What do I know? But uh, no wonder opportunity and spirit are so beloved and so much a part of our pop culture. Uh, they are literally and figuratively rock stars. Uh, the mission ranks number one on the public awareness scale. In TV, we call that a Q rating. Now, if I had opportunities Q rating, I'd still be at CNN. <laughs> now, I think, the, I think the thread that connects Schiaparelli to, and Lowell to opportunity and spirit and Phoenix is the quest for understanding if there's life outside our planet. Uh, you and those of us in the media, well, I guess I'm now technically a recovering journalist, uh, have done a, a good job setting the bar on what might or might not be found on Mars. Uh, there aren't many people left who are expecting <laughs> to see Marvin the Martian or the ruins of an ancient civilization on Mars, even though some people are still fixated on that uh, silly old face image captured by Viking and ultimately debunked by the global surveyor. I guess I can safely now share with you an expression we have in the newsroom, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. My sense is people will be pretty excited if you found a fossil. Matter of fact, uh, we have empirical proof. Given the DEF CON 1 media cluster event <laughs> surrounding the Allen Hills 84001 meteorite announcement. Uh, it's not exactly what SETI had as in mind when they sold on looking to make contact, but microbes on Mars are enough to lure people away ever so briefly from American Idol. I guess the moral of this is because we are among the living, we generally are interested in other living things. And this brings me to the other great narrative that plays out here. It's the story of all of you. Uh, I often wonder if you're all big gamblers. You know, when you go to Vegas, are you big on the tables? Because what you do is such an all or nothing thing. In some cases, you risk a whole career on a six minute plunge through an alien atmosphere. I mean, that's, that's all in, baby. Um, <laughs> This is as exciting as science can be. You know, we weren't there for the serendipitous moments when they stumbled onto Teflon or Velcro or Post-it notes <laughs> and, and said Eureka and then called the patent lawyer. Uh, but, but we are here with you over your shoulders uh, when you have those unbridled moments of joy when that all-in bet pays off or not. Uh, in the business, we call this good TV. Suspense, reality, possibly smoldering holes in the ground. <laughs> Everything but a vote to see who gets booted off the island. <laughs> now, Steve Squires and I did a uh, special when the Phoenix landed, successfully. And uh, I gave all due praise to the gods of orbital mechanics as the Earth received time of the intended landing was near the end of an hour. And so I told CNN, and with the notion uh, it would be a great idea to do an hour on Mars, and we'll have some recorded pieces, and we'll look at some of Steve's favorite images from Mars over the years. And of course, frequent cuts to the control room live as the team endured that hellish six minute period, that final stretch of the long trip to Mars. It really was a nail butter. And uh, even better, as Phoenix fell to Mars, we had data the whole time. How cool was that? Uh, and then the eruption. We could not have storyboarded an hour any better than that. And no scripts, right? No net. <laughs> the ratings were huge. The audience, global. Um, but the story, really, if you think about it, was not so much about Mars that day. It was about all of you, the humans who made it happen. So the human adventure doing, of doing all this is the great connection between those of you here and those of us who only get a day pass to Disneyland for nerds. So let's be honest. This is not a, a strong suit for most scientists, right? For whatever reason, however, you've been blessed with some key people over the years who are great communicators from Sagan to Squires. So I bet you're thinking, well, Miles, if this is so, why isn't there more coverage in the mainstream media of our exploits? In the good old days, it was different, right? The coverage was longer, better, and deeper, uh, as opposed to faster, better, cheaper, I guess. The, the, report, the reporters were enthused. They were practically cheerleaders. 
except for David Frost. And the whole world, the whole world was watching. Oh, and the women were more beautiful, and the beer tasted better, too, and the kids were smarter. Anyway, so what happened to the media? Why do we seem more interested in Britney Spears than Tony Spear? What's up with that? OK, it's a slightly rhetorical question. Besides, how the hell should I know? I just got canned. Seriously, though, a lot of this has to do with the space agency which you are affiliated with, affiliated with. NASA ascribes to the no Buck Rogers, no Bucks philosophy. And there's probably some truth to all that. But sending humans into the vacuum creates a bit of a vacuum for the likes of you, sadly. Uh, it's simply hard to compete with those operations in Houston and Florida. Too much money and too many flights, fights over how the money has or will be spent. Shuttle launch coverage, sadly, has degenerated into little more than a death watch type of coverage. And the space-savvy press corps seems poised to pounce on the next gaffe. The fact that CNN wiped out its entire highly decorated, I should say, science and technology unit, including yours truly, I say ever so humbly, should tell you a lot about where things are right now in the mainstream media. We're talking about plate tectonics here, though. Uh, the world is shifting beneath the media's feet. Once upon a time, we had healthy newspapers in this country. Soon we'll have nothing to line the birdcage or wrap the fish. So what's the advice? Plastics. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> that's, that was for an older speech. Uh, I guess I need to update that one. It's the internets, all of them. Seriously, what you, what you in a sense, started in 97 with Pat, the Pathfinder Webaganza. Can you believe he's a senator now? What a great, this is a great country. It's all grown at a Moore's Law clip. Today, bloggers, tweeters, Facebookers, random folks ranting with a DV camera and a Mac can do and can compete with a huge, globally deployed standing army of journalists with all their satellite trucks and their producers and their makeup artists and their reporters. There are interested people out there. The mainstream media may no longer be the best way to reach them, however. It just looks a lot different than those news conferences in the 60s and 70s. So whatever you do, I encourage you not to stop. Of course, don't stop exploring. Uh, but also don't stop thinking of new ways to speak directly to your audience. This is the future. You get it here. I know that. But I'm just underscoring the point. My teenage kids insist on a two-way transaction on everything they do. Uh, if they can't be a part of your adventure, they're out of here. So fortunately. This is what you do here. And a long history of letting the public in is what you're all about. And letting them look over your shoulders as you do your work. That's courageous. That's part of the risk, right? Just keep exploring new ways to engage them. Never stop thinking of what is just over the horizon on whatever planet you happen to be on. Thank you very much. One of the more significant accomplishments of this mission, I think the, uh, for me, the one metric or the one measure that really captures it is that is the realization that spirit and opportunity have made this strange alien world a familiar place. We now live in a larger neighborhood. And this adventure continues for these two rovers to explore and discover for the benefit of all. These rovers, this mission, and your labors are the finest examples of what humankind can do. Well done, opportunity and spirit, and well done to you all. Thank you very much.